Hi, right, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics. And in this video, I'd like to discuss the um, very serious situation that we may now find ourselves in pandemic-wise, which may actually be even worse than at any point before, as Boris Johnson loses his authority to act even late. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So uh, here we are, yet again, on the upward stage of an exponential rise in COVID cases. And, and I get that the word exponential is largely alien to non-mathematicians. A lot of people who hardly have heard the word before COVID came along. You know, people will stroke their chin when we talk about an exponential rise in cases and muse on the word and recognize that in the context of the pandemic is not a good word. What it means is that you can, in the space of a week, increase your number of cases 10 times easily. You know, and it has to be hoped that this does not occur. But we'll have no idea because we've reached our testing capacity. You know, I mean, in fact, in terms of recorded cases, I mean, that, as I say, that is unlikely to occur. You know, it's like, we'll run out of tests. That's it. If it goes much higher, we have no idea that it won't be reflected in the data. The rate of growth is currently vertical. Some newspapers are reporting that we've lost control of the virus. There's talk of a circuit break as well as a load of other measures. The cabinet had a meeting yesterday and, and it's been reported, I don't know how accurately, that the government have drawn up some plans, which includes this circuit breaker. You know, but if it comes at all, because that's what I want to get onto. If it comes at all, it will come too late because it's already too late because the time for it was actually before now. And it's not even coming now. It's already too late. Plus, we need to remember that lockdowns are caused when the rate of infection is out of control. They're used to bring it back down to manageable levels, but we never do that because the level at which we can manage things is very poor. We don't have decent track and trace. We don't have sensible measures in place. We don't have adequate sick pay for people needing to isolate. You know, um, schools, absolute shambles. We don't have proper ventilation. We don't have face masks. You know, we may or may not have this circuit breaker, but because the time of it, timing of it, at both the beginning and the end will be political, it won't do its job. But we face another problem because we know that the measures just passed by Parliament for England last week are not enough. We knew they weren't enough at the time. How do we know this? Well, the experts are quite clearly telling us, but also we've seen that those they provided little against the rise of Omicron in Scotland, where mostly the same measures have been in place, well, all year, really. Basically, there are two ways to look at the measures that are already needed. The first way, and the most optimistic outlook, is that Boris Johnson went along with his plan B last week against serious opposition from his own MPs because he just about had the ability to do so. He will wait, as he always does, until public opinion is positively screaming for more measures and forces MPs to bite the bullet and accept much tougher restrictions against their own ideology. This is what he's done all through the pandemic. He's waited until it was politically easy to do because he's got no backbone. Waited until there was no other option. It was better for him to lock down late and long than to put in preventative measures like face mask mandates before it got that serious. And this is because a significant core of his own party oppose any measures whatsoever. The same MPs who vote against freedoms like the right to peaceful protest claim that having to wear a face mask is a grievous blow against freedom. Even though they aren't prohibiting any activity, they're just asking people to wear safety gear while they do it. No different in concept to a crash helmet or safety goggles. These same MPs voted to force people to have certain documentation to be able to vote and yet claim that the COVID passes, which is not a vaccine passport, by the way, as has sometimes been reported, is an outrage because we're not a show your papers society. Basically, there are a lot of hypocrites and Johnson always lacked the authority to face them down. So he waits until their own constituents are haranguing them. This is the best outcome, but it's still, you know, Omicron spreads so much more quickly than the other variants, which means that in the past he may think, well, we delayed for a week and yeah, that meant we had to lock down for longer, but you know, we got away with it. But with Omicron, you delay for a week, that means it's raged out of control to a much higher degree than would have been the case for Alpha or Delta. But then there's the second thing, because it can be worse. 
The second way of looking at the situation is that Boris Johnson has only just got his plan B in operation with a stern warning from MPs to go no further. He had to promise them that he wouldn't do anything over the Christmas recess, that he'd recall Parliament if he was even planning on doing something. The fear is that he is now incapable of applying tougher measures. Not because he can't, you know, he would need Labour's votes again, of course, but he could get tougher measures through as long as not many more Tory MPs rebelled. But if the Tory rebels threaten to trigger a leadership challenge, if Johnson even tries to do anything beyond Plan B, then the public and NHS could be held hostage by the swivel-eyed loons of the Conservative Party. Losing that by-election last week means that Johnson has no authority in his government anymore. None at all. Unlike a Prime Minister with a commanding majority, he must now behave as he began, by trying to do deals with MPs to get anything through Parliament. If the 99 MPs who opposed even the Plan B threaten a leadership challenge if Johnson does anything else, he may be over a barrel. And so may we all. 99 MPs is not enough to topple him. It's more than enough for the confidence vote, but not enough to defeat him. But if those 99 are joined by others who only just accepted Plan B but will not accept a Plan C, as well as those who Plan B, Plan C, they don't care, but they just want Boris Johnson gone because he's lost their trust now, then the 181 MPs needed to remove him may exist. You know, the country is being held hostage by extremists because we allowed ourselves to have a government of such incredible weakness in the face of genuine challenges. The virus doesn't care what you believe. It does not care what you consider personal freedoms. The virus profits in an atmosphere of ignorance and apathy. So I suppose the question would be, if he is threatened, would Johnson take the threat seriously? Only takes 15% of Tory MPs to trigger the confidence vote, but you need over 50% to actually defeat him. Would enough Tory MPs feel that now is the time to get rid of him? And would they go along with getting rid of him as part of a ploy to prevent public health measures against the virus? It might be a fairly complicated political calculation for many Tory MPs. On the one hand, if enough MPs support Johnson, then he's immune for another year. If you trigger a confidence vote and he wins it, you can't trigger another one for a full year. There might be Conservative MPs who feel that Johnson has to go but maybe not just yet. But they don't necessarily want him in place for a full year. But, you know, again, damaging scandals could reflect on them. But on the other hand, if they do get rid of him, is there a danger they could get someone even worse in place? Or are they getting someone in place who will then have to share the blame? Bear in mind, there are some who want to get rid of Johnson because they consider him too left-wing. Right, think on that. They want to replace him with someone even further to the right. There are people who say of the prospect of Boris Johnson being forced to resign that his replacement could be even worse. Absolutely true. Don't dismiss the possibility, even the probability. I'm going to cover that in a video later this week. You know, I've said it before, but the reason why I want him gone with all haste, not because I believe that his replacement will be better. I think that would be naive. But because Johnson will have to be removed before the next election anyway, if it must be done better sooner than later. Because the longer this goes on, the less time his successor will be in office before the election. Like Keir Starmer said, that the public will no longer give the Prime Minister the benefit of the doubt. But make no mistake, Johnson's successor will instantly be given the benefit of the doubt. The public will give them time to prove themselves. And they'll also be happy to accept that ongoing disasters were just the aftershocks of Johnson's disastrous time in office. In order to get the public to turn against Johnson's successor, they need to be in place for a decent length of time before the election. So Johnson needs to go sooner rather than later, no matter how much worse the next one is. But the problem with that also is you're, you're talking about a leadership challenge in the middle of the Omicron surge, which is a, a, a very serious public health problem. But at the same time, if he's got no authority to lead us through it, even in his ramshackle way, then what choice do we have? You know, there does also exist the possibility that Johnson's successor will cause a rupture in the party. The current parliamentary party were carefully vetted in the image of Johnson's Brexit aims. The next leader may have different priorities, which may not be as unifying in the same way. Another reason why some Tory MPs will not be in a rush to replace Johnson, even if they do think there is a better alternative, there's no guarantee that their pick will become the next Prime Minister. 
But in amongst all this politicking, there is that problem of what happens in another week because this circuit breaker, if planned at all, is going to be for after Christmas. So we're talking another week at least. What happens with another week of inaction if the Omicron variant is, is laying us waste? Bear in mind, Friday night, London was short of 100 ambulances because hundreds of crew were off with COVID. It's not just a matter of how many people need hospital treatment, but how many medics are ill themselves and able to work to get people to hospital, to care for them in hospital. The grown-ups are trying their best. Last week, the sun emblazoned on its front page that the Queen would be going ahead with her Christmas festivities. A day or two later, she replied, am I bollocks, and cancelled them. Those may not actually have been Her Majesty's exact words. I don't know how she phrased it herself, just to be clear. The Chief Medical Officer tried to stress the importance of prioritising social interactions, given that the government wouldn't regulate them. In return, he was chewed out by an MP who then hastily deleted her tweet once colleagues explained what her own words actually meant. I did have a particular thought about this balance of advice between elected members of parliament, because that's what they're trying to push. This idea you should only listen to elected members of parliament. Unelected officials should have no say. The elected members of parliament are now on a three-week Christmas break. Sure, the good ones will be doing some ministerial or constituency work, or both. But, but there will be plenty who are just doing nothing related to their role as an MP. They may be lining their pockets with consultancy work, maybe, or just putting their feet up. But the unelected public health official in the form of Professor Whitty is going to be working the COVID wards this Christmas. He even suggested that it was likely to be needed to cover for staff absences on Christmas Day itself. So the expert, though unelected official, will be working to save lives at Christmas, whilst the elected but distinctly inexpert MP will be jollying it up. I think I know which one I'd rather listen to when it comes to dealing with the pandemic. But although her sentiment was clumsily expressed, hence her need to de delete all trace of it, it's also a widespread view within the Conservative Party. Boris Johnson may be told that the NHS is melting at some point, very soon. Might even be in the next week. But it will come. He'll be told that the measures which were on the, the weak side were not enough. In fact, he has already been told that. And that stronger measures are now urgent. Public opinion will be in favour. Maybe not as strongly as in the past because of Johnson's lo loss of trust. You know, in the past, those measures would be announced. Too late, which means more lives will have been lost with the delay and the measures would have to be deeper and last longer than if we'd just been sensible throughout. But it would then be politically easy for Johnson to argue. But if MPs are warning Johnson that anything even resembling a lockdown will result in his dismissal as Prime Minister, what then? We, we let the NHS melt down? And remember what that means. doesn't just mean beds full. Frankly, it melts even before then because, like I say, frontline NHS healthcare workers are the most exposed to COVID, which means they are the most likely to be off with the infection. We already have terrible shortages in the NHS. Add on to that a load of doctors, nurses, paramedics, porters and others absent with infections as well. You can't even staff the beds we have. Absolute disaster. And unless those Tory MPs opposed to COVID measures relent, they could force the Prime Minister to do nothing at all. And that's the very real danger that we could be facing now. We are dependent upon Tory MPs who willfully refuse to believe scientific facts actually changing their mind and deciding to accept reality. Which might happen. It might actually happen. But I wouldn't bet my life on it. But many other people are. But those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, please also click the Patreon link for details. And until next time, I'll see you later.